So before I start, let me tell you that um, on the program schedule, we've uploaded a handout for the lecture yesterday morning where I talked about the, um, the three gap problem. And in this handout is the full proof of the three gap problem using the space of lattices, which also was one exercise in the tutorial. So you can, you can download it and, and have a look at it and let me have your comments. So today we're going, uh, although not today, but now we will talk about um, quasi-crystals. And if you just recall, what we are interested in is a point process which is generated by a set P that is then randomly rotated and dilated by the matrix KV, the rotation, and this diagonal matrix here. So just as a reminder, this is simply the matrix 1 over T, T to the, um, which way around did I do this? Yes. Is it 1 over t or t in the top corner? Huh? One, so it's correct, OK. And here we will have t to the 1, d minus 1, um, t to the 1 over d minus 1. Hmm? Other way around, right? Anybody has their notes with me? It's not in my notes, so I can't look back. Is it t or 1 over t? T, exactly. Ah, oh, doesn't matter. It's late. OK, so this is this matrix. And this was the rotation matrix that rotated the vector V to the first coordinate. And um, we've seen, and what we are interested in, the big question is, starting with a fixed point set P, do we understand whether this point process converges to a limit? So that's the big question. And um, what we have seen in uh, the previous lectures is that when P is, for example, the cubic lattice or any other Euclidean lattice, then this works. And today, in this lecture, we will talk about when P is a quasi-crystal of a certain type. And I'll tell you exactly of what type it is. One example of the cl class of quasi-crystals that we will study is the famous Penrose tiling. So of course, these are very famous. You just Google for it. And here's uh, one nice example of a, one of the classical Penrose tilings. These are aperiodic tilings of the plane. Um, and what we do to create a point set is we put a point at each vertex of this tiling. Yeah? And that will give us a point set. Now, how can we construct, the, for instance, the point set of the Penrose tiling? This is done by the so-called cut and project method. And <clears throat> how does this work? I will make a picture uh, creating a one-dimensional cut and project set, but we are interested here in higher dimensional cut and project sets. It's just a little bit easier to draw. So what we will start off with, so the basic idea is this. You start with some lattice that is in higher dimensions. We want to construct here a one-dimensional point set. Um, and we will have our physical space down here that in general will be RD. In this picture, it's R. And we will use an auxiliary space, which is RN. In this case, is RD. So here we will have RM. And n is equal to d plus m. This we will call the internal space, and this we will call the physical space. We choose a window set. 
which is a subset of Rm. And then we take all points that project orthogonally into this window set. This will be these points here. And then project those points onto the physical space, again orthogonally. So we create in this way a point pattern. And if this lattice that we use in the construction is sufficiently generic, in particular it shouldn't be aligned with a coordinate axis, etc., then you will get an aperiodic point set. At the moment, I don't, I'm, I don't really care. Even if it's not generic, I might create a periodic point set. I'm, 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 I'm happy with that for now. So let me write down what I've described to, the, to you there. So n is equal to d plus m. Um, if m is 0, it's just going to produce a periodic point set. I will call pi um, the orthogonal projection onto Rd. I will call this the physical space. And pi internal, the projection, orthogonal projection onto the internal space, Rm. Um, L will be a lattice in Rn of full rank. Full rank doesn't mean, I think Andreas, you've defined lattice to have full rank anyway. So uh, that will be a Euclidean lattice. And next, A will be the projection of our lattice onto the internal space, and I'll take the closure of this. So this will be an abelian subgroup of uh, Rm under addition. And um, A0 uh, will be the connected component of A that contains 0, contains the origin. So this then is a linear subspace uh, of Rm of dimension m1, let's say. So the idea is the following here, that when you start with a lattice and you look uh, at the image of this projection, uh, it could be dense in here. In this case, um, A would be simply equal to Rm, but it might not be dense. And usually in the quasi-crystal literature, this density is assumed because then you get the most interesting examples. But we don't want to do this. And the main reason is this gives a very nice construction of the Penrose tiling in this framework that we wanted to use, where indeed the projection is not dense. And when the projection is not dense, then A, then uh, the connected component will be not all of A, but rather the situation will look like this. So you have your linear subspace, uh, and then you have a direct sum over discrete uh, subspaces. So this is how it looks like. Um, now we take mu A to be the Haar measure on A, and we normalize such that 
if we restrict the Haar measure to the linear subspace A0, uh, is the standard Lebesgue measure. Uh, just a second. What's wrong? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, this is a typo. Absolutely. This is pi interior because we are in the interior anyway. Otherwise, absolutely. Very good. So now what I want you to do is to simply forget about that, right? I just want you to ignore that fact and simply think of A as Rm for now. This is just for the connoisseurs, if you like, the people who want to follow every little step, every little detail. And we are quite happy about this construction as it um, sort of allows us to, to unify several things in, in our work. Um, but it's not so crucial for what I want to explain. Now, I haven't yet said what the window set is because that really defines the, the cut and project set. So let me say what that is. So the window set is a subset now of A. So now the window set, let me call it window set. is now a subset of A. And what we'll assume usually is that um, it's bounded. And we also assume that um, the Haar measure of the boundary set, uh, of the boundary of, of, of the window set is 0. In this case, we say that uh, we have a regular window, and the corresponding cut and project set is regular. So what is now our cut and project set? So that's now the point set that we're interested in. That will be, for example, the point set of, um, that will be the vertex set of the, of, of the Penrose tiling for an appropriate choice of dimensions, projections, and windows. Sorry, dimensions, choice of lattice and windows. So this will be, as I explained here, this will be now the blue points down here. So the projections onto the physical space. Of all the lattice points that fall into the window set when projected onto the internal space. So this is the definition. So this is the whole construction, the whole cut and project construction. Are there any questions about that? <clears throat> now, we have another little condition here that will make our life a little bit easier. We always will assume that, well, I shouldn't put that in brackets, that W and L are chosen in such a way um, the points of our lattice that fall into the window set are in in one to one correspondence oh, what am I writing here with our cut and project set. So in order to achieve this, you could just make your window set a little bit smaller if you, if you have sort of, if, if a finite number of points would project onto the same point in P. So we just want to rule out this thing so that we have a nice one-to-one um, -one correspondence between the points in here and in there, right? You could imagine that there are two points on top of each other, not in this one, but if the window set would be bigger and you had some 
points sitting on top of each other they would uh, project onto the same. We want to rule this out. Again, that's a small technical condition. So the first question we can ask when uh, trying to understand the distributional properties of such a set is how many points are there in a big ball? And that's a classic result in the quasi-crystal literature which states that the number of points in such a cut and project set providing this is uh, a regular set is proportional to the volume of the ball and Andreas will prove that formula tomorrow. Is that correct, Andreas? <laughs> okay, so that's our theorem one. Um, proved by Hof in 98, Schlottmann, also in 98, and then I think there's another name I forgot here. Um, and as we will see, uh, this is not, um, this just goes back to vial equidistribution, so that, uh, that doesn't require big machinery, but it just was proved at this time because people were interested in this kind of question then. So what do we do? As before, we um, look at the number of points in a ball of radius uh, T, compare it with a volume of the ball, take the limit as t tends to infinity. I called this limit theta, so that's the definition of theta if that limit exists, and the answer is um, that it's the Haar measure of the window set divided by the volume of this thing here, where V is the linear subspace RD cross A0. Okay? So this means the number of points in a big ball of radius T grows like the volume of that ball times this proportionality constant. So in other words, this is the density of that point set, the asymptotic density. And Andreas will show you how this works tomorrow. We'll take it as a given fact, because now we want to come back to this question. Can we show that this converges, the point process that we get from P converges to a limit? And um, What I will show you today is that Ratner's theory helps us to answer this question. And what we will do is, as for in the case of lattice, we will derive an equidistribution theorem for large spheres on the corresponding moduli space um, that will establish this convergence. Right. So the first task is I have to explain to you what is that moduli space. Let me clean the board first. And as you see, what I've just erased, there is a lattice lurking in the background, the lattice L. Now, this lattice is now a lattice not in D dimensions, as we discussed before, but in, a, in the higher dimensional auxiliary space. So it's not a surprise to you that the limiting moduli space that characterizes our point process will live on this big n-dimensional space of lattices. And so we will now, okay, let me call this G tilde. Consider the group SLNR, gamma SL 
and z, gamma tilde. Um, and as before, g will be sl dr, and gamma will be sl. Do I need it? No. Let me leave that away. So sl dr will still feature because we're looking at a point set in d dimensions, which we are rotating by a d by d matrix and dilating by a d, a d by d matrix, diagonal matrix. Is there a question? Modulo. Here? Yes. Aha. Uh -huh. OK. So that's a very good question. I'm sorry that I sort of glanced over that. This is a linear subspace of Rn. So it's basically Rd, it's d plus m1 dimensional. Just that, yeah? And so, so now I'm intersecting this subspace with the lattice L. And its effect of the construction that the intersection of L with this V will be a lattice in V. OK? And that will become clearer tomorrow. Maybe not. OK, will not become clear anyway. It will become clear. Maybe you concentrate of, of, of just A naught being Rm. Yeah. So, so just think of this being Rm, OK? Then the intersection here will just be L. And nothing will happen, OK? And so all we have here, then, is the volume of the fundamental domain of Rn modulo L. Does that make sense? Right, so, so Rn modulo L is a torus. And that's just the volume of that torus in this case. And that's, before we looked at lattices of co-volume 1, I haven't said here that L is a lattice of co-volume 1, so it could be something else. And also, in particular, what could happen is that if this is indeed non-trivial, then you could get other co-volumes. Yeah? Is that OK? Right. Now, we have an action of d by d matrices. And as it will turn out, these d by d matrices will act on this big space of lattices in n dimensions. And so the, the right, there is a right way here for us to embed SLDR in G tilde. And I'll call this embedding, so for a given G in G tilde in SLNR, I define this embedding, which will turn out to be the, the good thing to do. So I'm embedding G in G tilde by simply taking my matrix A in SLDR and mapping it to Um, the upper d by d block in SLNR, and then conjugating it by d. OK. And now, Ratner's theorem already gives us um, the structure of in which cases um, this embedding leads to interesting um, subspaces um, in the space of n-dimensional lattices. So Redner Redner's theorem, uh, or theorems, I should say, imply that there exists a unique closed connected subgroup. So for every such little g here in g tilde, and I'll call this hg, such that 
the following properties hold. First of all, if I intersect, so this could be a very small subgroup, HG. And I'm intersecting now the lattice SLNZ with this potentially small subgroup. And the statement is that this is a lattice in HG. Second, note, this is a characterization of HG, the things that I'm writing down here. Second, the image of the embedding of SLDR is contained in G. And third, if I consider the um, orbit of my embedding. So, you know, I have an action now of SLDR on my space of n-dimensional lattices, G tilde modulo gamma tilde, and I'm looking at the orbit that's given by that particular embedding. And the third point here explains the relevance of this group HG for this dynamical uh, interpretation. That is simply now the closure of this orbit is something nice. Namely, it's just the orbit of HG. Now, because gamma tilde intersect with HG as a lattice in HG, um, if you take HG modulo that lattice, it's a nice homogeneous space, and you can show that these two are, are somorphic. And um, we are going to denote by mu g the Ha measure on hg that becomes a probability measure on this quotient. And we'll also denote by the same mu g the corresponding probability measure on this space, yeah? which is the same under this identification. So, uh, so let me write this somewhere here. So, mu g is, now let me write it a bit bigger so then you have it nice in your notes. Let me write it over there. So why is this important? Well, you remember, we are rotating and dilating uh, with points in SL dr, this big lattice L. And now, what this family of subgroups HG describes is basically all possible subspaces in the space of n-dimensional lattices in which the dynamics can go, right? So if we are inside one of those subspaces, we will never leave it by our SLDR action. Okay, so mu hg, or simply nu g, is the unique hg invariant probability measure on this orbit. So it's the unique probability measure when multiplying from the right with elements, of all elements from hg. Um, and this is just the Haar measure on hg projected down and normalized. So let me just say comes from Haar measure, ah, comes from Haar measure on hg. So a trivial example, what would be a trivial example? Well, g tilde would be a subgroup that satisfy all these conditions. hg equals g tilde would satisfy all these conditions. Check it while I um, continue. 
Okay. So, remember what I uh, had in mind here is to um, tell you uh, something about a potential limiting, pro limiting process that we can describe in the case of lattices in D dimensions that, un that Andreas and I discussed earlier. Um, the limit was the space of lattices. And somehow the idea now is to construct an analog space of cut and project sets or space of quasi-crystals uh, that we can equip with a probability measure to get a point process that would be the xi that we're looking for, okay? So I need to now construct such a family of point sets that we can equip with a probability measure. And that probability measure will be exactly this uh, R measure here. <clears throat> okay, so let's pick G in G tilde and some delta such that um, the lattice that comes up in the construction of our cut and project set can be expressed as Zn times G. And then here I'll put this scaling factor so delta is just some positive scalar. Um, before we didn't have this, and the reason that we didn't have this before in D dimensions was that we always assumed L has covolume one. So then when we act with SL, the covolume is preserved. But now in the general construction of cut and project sets, we haven't assumed this because in general, uh, we want to start with an arbitrary lattice. And so this is just the scaling factor that will make this co-volume one lattice to uh, have the appropriate co-volume here. And then, um, <clears throat> what we show, and I won't prove this to you here because we only have limited time. It's just something for you to to believe, and I'm happy at this late hour you believe everything I say, right? Uh, so what is important now, we want to construct a family of such cut and project sets. So this is one cut and project set. Now I want to move this thing around. I want to move it around to create a whole family, and I want to put a probability measure on it and then say that's my point process. Now, what one can show, I write one can show OCS that if you move around this, you put an H in here, and so. I can write my lattice in this way for some g in g tilde. Now this g will define an hg over here. It's guaranteed by Ratna, guaranteed, okay? We have it guaranteed. This hg exists by Ratna's theorems. This hg, this subgroup here, I now take this sort of set of lattices, this whole family of lattices is parametrized by HG, and one can show that uh, the physical space in which we live is preserved. Now I have told you don't worry about it, so just think of this as RM. In this case the statement is sort of trivial, of course it's always an RM, and the other statement that we prove here is that, in fact, it's equal to A for almost every H in HG, and that's for almost every with respect to the Haar measure on HG, or the probability measure on, on, on here. So in this case, it would be the Haar measure for all H. Uh, it's always the closure, yes. 
Yeah, well, here we don't need it, but here it is. Yes, correct, Andreas. OK. So what does this mean? Well, it means that we now have a family of lattices. And in the construction of our cut and project sets, we don't have to change the A. That's a really good thing, because we don't want to change the A, because we want to keep the same window set. Okay? We don't want to have a space of quasi-crystals. When we move around, we also have to continuously change our window sets. That would not be very pleasant. And so this little lemma here uh, helps us to um, have this structure. And so now we can define a map. All I say here, by the way, is in uh, one of the papers on the reading list, let me just highlight this reading list. And this is a CMP paper. Uh, um, well, it's the only CMP paper on the reading list, Communications and Mathematical Physics. And as far as we are aware, this construction of families of quasicrystals is really new. And what we can now do, just as in the case of lattices, we can uh, define a map from um, this space here to cut and project sets, to the space of cut and project sets, where we now take a cut and project set with the same window. So the fact that we can here use the same window almost everywhere is because A is the same almost everywhere. And now we choose, instead of the original lattice, we choose the one that's translated by HG. <clears throat> OK? So this map, where we take a point in here, this is, oh, then that should be tildes here. This you can think of parametrizing now these set of cut and project sets. OK? So that's now the analog of what we had before, where we took a point in G mod gamma, and we established a bijection with the space of lattices. This now establishes a bijection of this space here, at least for almost every H, um, with these kind of cut and project sets. It's actually for every age because we could choose just the wrong window set. I mean, that's OK, I guess. Right? We can just do it. We can take the window set in the larger space and, um, and just do that. The only thing is these will not be nice cut and project sets in general. But that is good for almost every age. So what have I done? Well, now this is my xi, I claim. If I endow this space, I make it a probability measure by simply now taking h to be random with respect to this probability measure on, on that space, right? So this is in <clears throat> That's my claim. And how do we prove this claim? Well, we need to prove equidistribution as before. Now, the equidistribution theorem will be more complicated. And we will now indeed require Ratner's theorem for that. So theorem two. Um, So let G be in G tilde. That's the same G as over there. And then for any bounded continuous function, F from ST minus 1 times Hg to R 
we have that the following holds S. So we're now averaging this function over first coordinate is all the velocities that we're integrating over. The second coordinate is our embedded SL dr, rotation and dilation as before, times, so as before, lambda is a probability measure on the d minus one dimensional unit sphere that's absolutely continuous with the volume element on, the, on that unit sphere. And what the theorem says is that as t tends to infinity, this converges to the integral of f and uh, uh, okay why is that the good statement well, it's the good statement for exactly the same reasons that we discussed before, because now to prove <coughs> that the point process converges to, <coughs> that psi t converges to psi, what we need to show to prove convergence in finite dimensional distribution of these point processes is to pick here exactly the right characteristic function that says, I want R points in my specific test set, okay? Um, and you can convince yourself that I've chosen the embedding exactly in the right way to act, to respect this, um, this mapping here, yeah? So remember, phi G was defined as the conjugation by G so you embed let me make a picture we have we have our n dimensional space of lattices so start with a cubic lattice and then what we do we rotate our cubic lattice by g to make it the lattice l that we are actually interested in and then we are acting um, with sldr in a block form Right, because SLDR only acts on the physical space and leaves the internal space as it is. So we have G times this block form. I should do it like this. G times this block form, where here's the SLDR. And then just to make it an embedding, we have to also do G to the minus one to make it a, a, a group homomorphism, okay. All right, so by all that you've learned, uh, you hopefully believe me now that we can now show that theorem four makes sense. Uh, is this theorem four? No, it should be theorem three, right? Yeah, three, sorry. <coughs> is that now psi t converges to psi. And let me just remind you, psi t is again p k v dt with v random according to lambda absolutely continuous with respect to omega. The only thing that I haven't told you, the other, other ingredient is what? What else do we need to go from theorem two to theorem three? We choose the right characteristic function, fine. What is the other ingredient that we need? To make sure that our characteristic function has boundary of measure zero or has small boundary if we approximate sets in the right way. I need some feedback. 
I've been trained to ask for feedback, and I forgot it throughout the entire course. So now I need you to respond to me. What other important ingredient do we need to make sure that small sets, small test sets lead to uh, indicator functions here that have boundary of small, me uh, that have small measure? Ah, here it's heard something. What? Siegel Beach, yes. So, Andreas today proved to you the Siegel Beach theorem under certain assumptions, okay? So, he said that uh, the number of points in P should not grow too fast and we should have some uniform bounds on this, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, proof. Uh, theorem 2 plus siegel Veach and siegel Veach holds in this case. So we can check all those. In particular, the, we know how many points are in a big ball. We, in fact, know how many points are in a big ball for each of those guys. And so that's something Andreas will prove to you tomorrow, that this counting function, in fact, works. Another really cool thing that Andreas will maybe explain to you tomorrow is that for some quasi-crystals like the Penrose tiling, um, when you just look at the primitive point, so you sit on the vertex and you look in certain directions in the Penrose tiling, you have the property that there are lines, straight lines that contain infinitely many vertices. And so you can ask the analogous question of the question of how many primitive lattice points there are. It's the same here, how many primitive vertices there are. And there was no answer to that. And Andreas and I provided the answer, again, using siegel Veach backwards. OK, so that's very similar to what people do when they count uh, closed geodesics on or saddle connections on um, flat surfaces, where the counting of these is also a big question. And there, the siegel Veach um, uh, formula or approach um, also gives you that counting constant. So that's something Andreas will explain to you tomorrow. Both counting all vertices in the big ball and counting just the primitive vertices in the big ball. Now, what I haven't told you at all is, so now we have an abstract formula for this limiting process, right? We have an abstract group HG whose existence is guaranteed by Ratner. And we have, an, we have a Haar measure on this group, which we don't know what it is. So what I want to tell you now is what examples can you get for HG in the last 10 minutes? <clears throat> OK. So let's see. Let's go over here. Hmm? So that side on the right. Yes. Yes. So now this is this is a set. For each H I get a set. G is fixed, right? For each H I get a set. H varies over this this space. This space carries a probability measure. So this is now a probability space. And the push forward of this measure here under this map induces a probability measure on this set. So this is now a random set or a random point process, if you like. P is fixed. P here, very good. This P that we have over there is P of V delta 1 over n z to the n, g. So that corresponds to the point h equal to 1. Yeah? That's the thing we start off with. So that's our Penrose tiling. That's the one we start off with. Then I've constructed this whole space with a nice topology and a nice probability measure on it. That's the key point of what we are doing here. And then this is, of course, a very important statement. And that follows from Ratner's theorem in particular, and I should say this, it follows from a beautiful theorem corollary of Nimesh Shah, 
to Ratner's theorem that deals with these kind of equidistribution problems in, in great generality. And uh, I know all this, uh, uh, Andreas and I owe, owe Shah's theorem a great deal. Uh, um, okay, right, where was I wiping the board? Over here. So now let me give you a few examples of G's that lead to particular HG's. And uh, if I manage, I hope to even go to the Penrose tiling. Okay. So the first proposition, and as I said, everything I'm telling you here you can find in the paper of Andreas and me. And it is really written for someone uh, who is new to the subject. We, we were, in fact, new to quasi-crystals when we, when we started with this. M less than D, and L is equal to ZD plus MG, such that, OK, pi, this is just some technical uh, assumption. What do I want to say here? Pi L is injective. Pi restricted to L is injective, which is often a, a standard assumption. Then um, HG is, in fact, all of G tilde. OK? So if the dimension of your internal space is strictly less than D, you never get anything else but the full G tilde. So the limit will always be the full space of lattices. And a nice example is something that was studied in the, in the, in the literature for the Lorentz gas was uh, by, by Wenberg, Wenberg um, the so-called Fibonacci quasi-crystal, where you take Q times Z, which will be a point set in R2, periodic in one direction, and this Q here is the following point set, 1 plus tau squared plus um, 1 over tau square root 1 plus tau squared This is distance to nearest integer. Um, so you look at this sequence of points where j, j runs over all integers. And tau here is the golden ratio. So we call this the Fibonacci quasi-crystal. So you have a one-dimensional set here that is exactly given by this cut and project pro construction that I wrote down in the, in, the first, um, in the first few minutes. And here you see, well, this set you can construct uh, from a lattice in R2 projecting on a one-dimensional space. So what are the dimensions here? We have a cut and project construction in R3 because it's you know, R, R times R2, and we project onto R2. So M is what? M is 1, D is 2, so M is less than D, strictly less than D. So this applies. So if you start with this set P here, and you do our stuff, you'll always end up in the space of lattices of dimension 3 now, OK? So we start with a two-dimensional point set, and our limit distribution is a cut and project set from a three-dimensional random lattice. Now, another very interesting construction, and that's the one that's coming from, that's, that will lead to the Penrose styling, is the following. And these are the most prominent, as far as I can tell, uh, ways of constructing interesting quasi-crystals. They are based on a number theoretic construction. Oh, 
Okay. So K is a totally, if you don't understand these words, uh, number field of degree. So this is algebraic, classical algebraic number theory, n greater than equal to 2 over the rationals. So an example would be you take the rationals and you adjoin square root 2, for example. That would give you a degree 2 number field. OK is the ring of integers in that number field. So in this Q adjoint square root 2, it would be things that look like m plus square root 2 plus n. m and n are integers. Um, and you can now define embeddings of this number field. into the real numbers. So these are n distinct embeddings. And that allows you to represent an algebraic number as an R, as a vector in Rn. And um, what you can then do is you can then associate with that a lattice by simply taking the embeddings of your integers in that number field. And they will look like this. So I'm embedding them in this way. Uh, where x is in O, K. And don't say anything, Andreas. I'll do this for pedagogical reasons. Hmm? Yes, if it's a totally real number field. That's in the assumption. So you can always find that. So now this would what be what? This would be a n-dimensional vector here. But I actually don't want to just create an n-dimensional lattice, a dimension in n dimensions. I want to create a lattice in d n dimensions. So I am not just taking uh, one number here, I'm going to take a d-dimensional vector and embed that component wise. Okay? Anyway, it's a detail. Uh, for those of you who are a little lost now at the end of the day, just take for granted, we'll start with a number field, and that, in a canonical way, we, we construct a Euclidean lattice in R. This will be a lattice of full rank in R to the N D. OK? And now, this R and D, that will be my R N that I use for my construction. So N is equal to N times D. And um, to cut a long story short, if we start with such a lattice here, um, what will be HGB? Because in the end of the day, all I need to tell you, or you need to tell me, the lattice that you want to take, and here is a lattice that you get from this number theoretic construction, and then you say, well, but what is the HG that will give me my nice probability space of cut and project sets? And in this case, one can work out that HG is g times uh, SL dr SL dr SL dr uh, times g to the minus 1, where they are exactly n copies of that. 
okay? And how do you get the G? Well, the G, right, as before, it's the same procedure. We write the lattice L as some scaling factor times Zn times G. And we read off the G from that. So, that should be it for today. What I have here on these two pages is, and you can see it's very little, the construction of the Penrose tiling using exactly this. But I'll spare you that, okay? All I say is, what you do here is you take SK, this number field, um, you choose uh, a particular embedding and, and, uh, and then you go through this construction and uh, you choose a very particular window set uh, that will lead to the vertex set of the Penrose tiling, exactly following this construction. Now, um, the groups that you get, so remember what we had to do then is we had to take SLNZ and intersect it with HG. And what you will get if you do that, you will get a Hilbert modular group. And so the Hilbert modular group appear very naturally here as the groups that stabilize uh, this family of cut and project sets or quasi crystals. Okay, so what we're going to do tomorrow is two things. The first thing is, as promised, Andreas will tell you how to prove that the number of points in a quasi-crystal grows like the volume of the ball, and then also the corresponding questions for the primitive points in a quasi-crystal. And then the last lecture tomorrow will be a more entertaining lecture. It won't be on the board. It will be about another application of, of our theory to uh, graphs and networks namely circulant graphs and how we can calculate the diameters in these graphs and make statements about their value distribution in the limit of large graphs, um, as large random graphs in, in these particular families. So that'll be hopefully a nice entertaining end of the lecture course. Uh, so I'm really happy that still so many of you are here and so thank you very much.